Hi everyone, welcome back to my top 500 games. We are currently at number 370 and oh boy, this is going to be a bit controversial I think because this is a game that is by some considered to be one of the best games ever, one of the foundational games of all games, which I can understand and I agree that it has a very significant point in our history, but I rate it number 370 and that game is Tetris. I know there are a few variations of Tetris out there, but the specific version that I played was the one that came on the Game Boy, the black and white one where each of the individual pieces had their own distinct pattern on them. If you don't know what Tetris is, then who are you and why are you watching a video on my top 500 games, I don't know, but if you don't know what it is, you basically have blocks coming from the roof of the level. Each block consists of four squares all bolted together, you have to put them down and whenever you get a full line, the line disappears and you basically just have to survive for as long as you possibly can, getting as many lines or points as you can. My main memory of this game, which may seem very strange, is that my uncle used to really like this game. My uncle Darren, he used to come over quite a lot and what would happen is he would play this game and his girlfriend at the time would also play it and they would both do much much better than I would and I was like how do you do so well and I didn't understand and they would kept saying oh I can't really explain it but I don't actually remember why I got this game originally I do believe that I asked for it but I don't remember where I originally heard about it but I think I did ask for it and then my mum got it for me one day. So yeah, that's my biggest memory of Tetris is trying to beat my uncle at it and never being able to. Number 369 is Rayman Jungle Run. Now this is a game that probably would be higher in the list if I had played a different version of this game because the version that I had played of this game was the version that came on the Windows 10 desktop version because I had a Windows 10 sorry no I'm getting mixed up Windows 8 uh, Windows 8 uh, desktop and so I, I got it from there and that's where I originally played it and it's one of those endless runner style games so you know you just run forever and you gotta tap the screen to do the thing like jumping most of the time which is basically what you did and I managed to do that for like the first world or so you know go running through the levels collecting as many lumps as I could but the problem was that the way that the game was set up was that you actually had, instead of being able to, like say, press on a touch screen where you press on the left or you press on the right to jump or do the punch attack, which is what you eventually unlocked, you had to click on the screen. So it got really awkward and it got to the point where I couldn't move the mouse cursor from one part to the other to be able to differentiate between jumps and attacks. and that's where I stopped and I probably would have enjoyed this game more if I was able to play it on a different system and in fact I do have it on my phone I just haven't really played it so if I was to play it I'd probably uh, rate it higher but that was my experience with that. Number 368 and yet again we have another game that is seen as one of the most foundational games of our gaming history and again I can completely understand but to me this game isn't as good overall and I know this is going to bring up some debates but okay I'll, I'll explain what I'm thinking right the game itself is Super Mario Brothers the original one on the Nintendo the original Nintendo the one that came with Duck Hunt that Super Mario Brothers now I am not going to deny that Super Mario Brothers as a game when it came out was very good. It sort of set the foundation for platform games to come and it had all, you, you know, it had things such as being able to accelerate and jumping, specific jumping physics and having a series of different levels that were set up differently. It had things that were very important and I understand that and obviously I do enjoy this game to an extent. But I believe that one of the big reasons that this game gets so, so much praise is because of nostalgia. Basically, this is a game that came out with the Nintendo, uh, the original Nintendo. I believe it came free with the NES in America. 
I might be wrong there, but I believe that's what happened, but it was kind of like, everyone had it, so of course, everyone's going to have nostalgia about it. Not saying that your nostalgia isn't relevant, of course I'm not, I'm, obviously I'm not saying that. I mean, half of these games so far I've been telling stories about like nostalgia and stuff, so I'm, I'm not dismissing that. I just think that that's why it gets more, uh, like a higher rating than what I would think it would otherwise, in general. But, yeah, it's a good, decent platformer. There really isn't uh, too much to say other than that it did set the bare foundations. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to stop talking about that now. And I'm going to move on to number 367, which is Bomberman. Just the original Bomberman. The way that Bomberman works is that it's basically uh, primarily a multiplayer game. You've got all these different Bombermen scattered on the level. Uh, usually up to four players, sometimes eight, depending on the version. And all the levels are based in like this grid formation and you have to drop bombs and they will unleash their explosion in a sort of cross shape. Any of the bricks that it hits on the way will be destroyed and you will cut power-ups on the way, such as being able to have a larger explosion or being able to move faster, things like that. And you basically have to be the last one to survive. It's a decent multiplayer party type game, I suppose. That's the best way I can describe it. Number 366 is Super Stardust HD, and I th believe that this was the first twin stick shooter that I had ever played. The way that it works is that you're on this planet or this sort of rock, like it might be a moon or a planet, I don't know, but you fly around it and use the right analog stick to shoot out in a particular direction, and there's all these asteroids coming inwards towards the planet and you have to blow them up and they will separate and stuff and you can pick up powers and switch between different types of weapons and get points that way and stuff against the point collecting type game just uh, not really much to explain there but this next game which is number 365 i do feel that i want to before i actually get to talking about this game I want to talk about a particular category of game that this game falls into and something that I want to just talk about and make sure that I am talking very, very clearly here and so that I can explain myself as much as I can, okay? There is a particular type of game out there which in some situations seems to get a lot of praise and this particular category of game I feel cannot well, I'm not going to say cannot. Yeah, actually, yeah, I will. I'll say it cannot reach the level of spectacle and um, the level of quality, rather, that you can get from the best games of all time. I just believe that these games can't do that. These games, I believe, are interesting for maybe a single playthrough. Uh, beyond that, probably not really much to brag on about, but I am basing this off experience alone okay and the type of game that i'm talking about is actually no stop there i'll just tell you what this game is and then i'll tell you exactly what i'm talking about this particular game is heavy rain heavy rain on the ps3 and the type of game that i'm talking about here is a purely strawberry story based game if i can get my words out properly a purely story based game and what i mean by that is a game that its foundation is set on the story that it tells, not the mechanics. Now, Heavy Rain does have some mechanics to it, which include your ability to press buttons in very yeah. weird and particular ways, which is rather unique to Heavy Rain. So that's an interesting thing about this game in particular. But when I get to these games in the list, I'm usually not going to talk much about them because really there's not much you can say without spoiling it, I suppose. And I just also want to make it clear that I make a big deal, in general, of saying that story isn't an important factor for me in games. Now, people take that as me saying that I think story doesn't matter at all, or I can't enjoy a story. That's not true. That's not what I'm saying here. It's just that when it comes to judging the games that I like the most, for example, uh, I'm not going to give any particular examples, we'll get to those when we get to those points in the list, but for example, my most loved games, I really, really 
have to defend myself when people say that these games are about story or something like that because there's a particular brand of game that this the heavy rain falls into which is i can say it is a story based game but i just want to make this clear just because a lot of people may think that a game is story based and just because the game has a lot of story in it that doesn't to me make it a story based game but heavy rain and other examples that i'll go through on this list and explain explain when i get to them they are story based and so i am basing this purely on a first playthrough my experience of when i played it through the first time and that's where heavy rain lies i really don't have too much to say about heavy rain i could talk about the story but i don't really have much to say i don't really want you to be honest so i'm just gonna move on i think i've spent enough time talking and trying to clarify myself there but let's move on number 364 is one of i suppose Kaz, you could say this is kaz harai's favorite game or one of his favorite games because it is rage racer yeah um the main thing that people remember this game for is that you have the space shooting type game that happens during the loading screen which has a big story behind it about you know the patent and all that but if you manage to complete that space shooty game during the initial loading screen you will unlock a lot more cars to control as in the game which sounds really strange to me as to why they would do that I, I don't know I think the difference I don't think there's any particular difference between the cars like performance wise I'm not too sure but you do have a few tracks usually there's only like two or so tracks or so it's it really is a very very small game um, there is the normal track and then there's the track whereby they kind of extend one of the paths and it's night time it's really really there's not much to say about this game apart from space shooting game at the start and at the time it does have pretty good graphics you may remember back when i was talking about battle arena torsenden i was saying that my granddad had a ps1 which eventually became my ps1 and he let me play on it and that's where i played battle arena torsenden on a demo but since then not since then sorry when i was there i actually also played ridge racer which i don't believe was on the demo it was just a separate game you just had ridge racer separately and so i played that there and so i was quite amazed with the graphics but i think i was already amazed at that point from battle arena torsenden number 363 is now remember earlier on in the very first part all the way back where I said that I wasn't going to include collections and I tried to explain exactly what I meant by this and I said that there was going to be one exception to this there's going to be one exception where we take multiple games and stick them in a collection and just count the collection and this is it this is the one exception to the rule and that game is Metal Slug Anthology the reason I am including this is because I have played Metal Slug Anthology and I have played through all of the Metal Slug games that were on that. I may have missed maybe a couple of them, but I did play through at least almost all of them from start to finish. With Infinite Lives, obviously, and Infinite Continues because, I mean, otherwise it would just be too hard. But I did that and the whole experience kind of melds into this one experience of Metal Slug. And the way that Metal Slug works is that you pick one of the few characters and it's kind of like a 2D, I'm not going to say platformer because it's more focused on your ability to like aim and shoot the enemies and stuff. It's more arcadey in that sort of context, I suppose. But my first experience of Metal Slug Anthology was at university. I actually played Metal Slug 3 for the first time on the PS2. It was in a particular room at the university which had loads of PS2s and that's where I first played it and that's where I thought this is quite interesting this and I had quite a good time with it. What is actually interesting about Metal Slug in general is that what you'll find is that there's a lot of things that can happen that are very specific to the situation that they present to you such as there's one level whereby you can turn into a zombie and it's like the zombie is very very specific for that particular level and as a zombie you can do this weird giant vomiting attack but you can't run very fast 
And it's very strange because it's sort of like designed as a game mechanic, but it was very, very specifically put in for that part. So it's kind of like whenever they design a level, they design mechanics to go with it. So things are very specific to the specific areas. Another example of this would be the different vehicles, the way that the different like submarines and tanks and stuff control. Also there's this thing where you save hostages and then at the end of the level it will count up how many hostages you've saved. But if you die at all, it will erase the memory of how many you've saved. So you have to just do it all and not die, which is so hard. I don't know how you could do it without just being amazing at the game. Which maybe if I played these games when I was a lot younger, when I played them in the same environment that I had done when I played the Mega Drive games and all that, maybe I would get a lot better at those games. So maybe that's what would happen. Maybe it's just all contextual. But I am going to move on from that and I'm going to talk about number 362, which is Puzzle Bobble Live. Now, Puzzle Bobble is basically a game that everyone's seen many, many times and it's taken many, many forms. You may have seen it as Buster Move or something like that, but it's basically where you've got the bubble bobble type dinosaur thing and it's controlling a little contraption which will shoot out these balls up through the level and you have to get them to bounce off the walls and then hit the, hit the ones with the same colour so that they match and they'll disappear and that will destroy all of the ones below it that aren't linked to the ones above it and your basic aim is to destroy all of the bubbles in the level but do it as fast as you can I suppose. Number 361 is Half Minute Hero. This is a game on the PSP that was well became well known for its particular type of style. It was known as like the fast RPG, like oh RPGs are really long and slow and take a long time. Let's make one that's really fast. So they'll present this story which is like aha I am the evil overlord, you can't defeat me. And then they'll present a level whereby you'll have so much time and then you'll have to run around, defeat enemies in order to get money and experience and you can spend that on like time extensions and stuff. And the way that battles work is it's it's very strange. Like you go enter a battle and your character will just run forward and kill all the enemies and you'll take however much damage. It's like a quick maths calculation and then it just ends the battle there. So then you have to use that to buy all the upgrades and get all the level ups that you can thing is though, I would say this is more of a puzzle game because it's more about solving the puzzle of how to find the right things to get in order to progress through the level and complete it within the time limit. It's presented as an RPG because that's the theming, but I wouldn't have actually called it an RPG in that same sort of way that I would with RPGs. But anyway, I'm going to end this episode here and I will catch you all in the next one where we'll continue on from number 360, and I'll see you then. So, bye!